We're in a new location. Mm-hmm. Stino, tell us about where we are right now. Well, you are in uh, my garage. It's called a spin and spade. Um, yes, this is the original standoff. We are here um, with the fact of what's going on in the world. It's not a bad wee spot to come, and I've actually had to spend the best part of six, seven hours clearing this place and making it back into a bar. So I have a feeling this is where I could be for a little while. <laughs> it's not a bad place if we are having to self isolate to no. do just that, isn't it? No, exactly Looking that. Around. We, um, we've crammed six blokes into a two metre cube. Um, recording a podcast with some BBC microphones that have probably travelled the country in the last week. So, yeah, we're absolutely sweet. <laughs> but, but you have brought along, Carl, some hand sanitizer, which we've... I have indeed. ...which we've been yeah. cleansing with, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as, you've, as you've been hearing, we've, we've also got James Scaisebrook with us today in your, in your very best phone voice introducing the show. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing, James? Yeah, good, thank you. Very good. Glad to be back in. I haven't been in here for a few weeks, so I'm glad to be back in there. A few weeks? Oh, yeah, I'd say. Might be 18 months, uh, is it? <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> it does. The, the premise of this this po- this episode of the podcast is basically because there's no there's no rugby going on at the minute. We're just mm. kind of just thinking, what are we going to be talking about? But we've we've opened it up to our listeners to send in topics and questions, uh, which they've done in their droves. Actually, it's been fantastic. So we'll get stuck into those in a moment. We'll start off just kind of talking about what we're doing at the minute. We'll start with you, James. Obviously. For the last couple of weeks, is it now? No, no rugby. <laughs> What's it been like? Um, stuck in the house with the kids, basically, um, and waiting for them to finish school now. And just been kind of well, a week or so of looking after the little one who's just over there being looked after by Steve-O now. And <laughs> um, just kind of being at home, really. Um, and just waiting for, I suppose, waiting like everyone else for the announcements of you know what's going to come next and what's going to come now and what's going to come next. I mean, that's the question, isn't it, for everybody? I mean, do we? No one has an idea because everything seems to change minute by minute, sort of at the minute, doesn't it? So, you know, as a, as a player, Gareth, for yourself, it, trying to keep in, in shape, thinking when are we going to be back? When are we going to be training? Must be quite. Hard. Of course, he is. That's why we're drinking Guinness so. <laughs> <laughs> at eleven thirty yeah, on a Friday morning. Yeah. <laughs> I've just done my insanity session this morning, so yes, I've earned that. Mm, there you, you go. Know, that's my. You know, that's my shake for today. Oh. <laughs> that's my reward so far. Full of honor. Um, yeah. Look. It, if we, it's the most bizarre scenario to be in, isn't it? Um, we haven't actually seen a lot of the lads haven't seen each other or been in contact. With any well, weird what, contact what, are the, what are the? Oh, oh my that, word! Oh dear. It's professional oh dear. for you, isn't it? Yeah. My bad. My bad. What What oh. are the rules? What are the rules <laughs> with this? Have you been told by the club you can't interact with each other or you can't see each other or, or so we, we've just sort of got uh, emails and updates from uh, Rob and the the, the docs really um, just saying that we've what we've been told really is we're going back on the 6th of April whether that happens or not you know what every way things seem to be happening everything changes every few hours so we can only just go on those basis we've been sort of told to go stay and not go into big groups um, and just sort of you know not self-isolate as such but you know be careful look after yourselves and um, we do have to try and keep ourselves fit now obviously at the minute we haven't being able to do that is very difficult um, but we we haven't actually been told not to see each other but most guys are tend to stay away from one another it's a bit like being part of normal folk now for you guys having to try and stay fit without having to actually have set sessions so it's like me every day what do I do oh, I gotta go for another run now you know what it feels like Gareth yeah, well, I, I I always struggle anyway. You know, if I get the opportunity to sit down and do very little, I'll do that. You know, yes. but um, yes. it's almost like pre-season, pre-pre-season. So you you only get like a pro, you only get like a five-week break, and for two of those weeks, you're told to do nothing. And we're kind of in that period a wee bit where, but I'm sure after you know, dear knows how long we're going to be stuck inside. Um, you know, cabin fever is going to f- set in, and fellas are going to want to get out and do things, and that's how we deal with that. It's probably at the minute because it's still relatively new and um, we're probably in a scenario where we're not in the holiday mode but we're sort of we feel like we've, we're in the second week now of being off effectively um, but now I think lads are going to start to think right we need to get ourselves back into some kind of nick you definitely have blokes checking their phones at Sunday evening like looking for their schedule just like wandering around in circles like lost sheep like what what, about, what am I going to do for lunch on Tuesday afternoon I'm completely confused by this concept yeah here's like the back end of your, of your off season when you are just like yeah I'm bored now 
ready to go back in no idea and you've left it in an even weirder situation where the league is just mid midway through and it's a complete unknown uh, unknown situation for all so, looking at odd. it very looking odd. at it as well James I mean the way that Chiefs have gone this year obviously top of the premiership playing well also having a great season in Europe it, it, from a really selfish point of view it's probably come at like a horrible time because this is if there's a season you didn't want there to be any sort of interruptions with this would be it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I suppose there'll be a lot of kind of teams in, in similar boats where they're in positions where they were kind of like frustrated that they can't kick on from what they're doing, whether it's, you know, the Chiefs pushing on for trophies and pushing on for Europe, which is obviously kind of the next step for the club, or whether it's teams, you know, trying to battle their way out of relegation, you know, and teams that are at the bottom that think, God, we could have done this. And if things stop as they have done in the leagues below, you know, there'll be a lot of frustrated teams with, for a lot of different reasons. So I think, you know, there'll be, a, there'll be plenty of frustration, but unfortunately, uh, kind of, it is what it is at the moment for everyone, and you have to kind of just sit down and wait. For, for you as well, personally, because I know there's probably quite a few Albion fans listening to this as well. It's obviously come at a time when just before the the, the rugby finished, it was kind of mentioned that you were going to be going off to Coventry, start a new new venture as a, a defence coach up there. So, what as the head coach of Albion still at the moment, I suppose? Are you, what sort of a how are you planning? Or are you able to plan? Well, the, you know, we were talking about this earlier that the, suppose you kind of you can plan, but you have to plan for a number of different scenarios, and that's kind of like what we were doing, um, and that's kind of what we will be doing moving on for next season and stuff with everyone that's planning for next year already now. Um, so you kind of just prepping for as many different scenarios as you can, so that when one of them crops up, you kind of reach into your little file of plans and you go oh, we'll take plan C and right let's implement that and then obviously but then with all those plans like most plans with everything you do it's got to be adjustable as well because things are, I've no doubt and may change again um, and just being prepared as best you can is the only thing we can do really yeah, it's going, to, it's going to be a mess. I mean, there's a lot more important things out there in sport and rugby at the moment. But as this is a rugby podcast, it is because of the Premiership is almost it's in a danger that it is a bit easier to call off because Saracens are already relegated. So there's already that sort of taken care of. And then, you know, Chiefs at the top of the pile. So realistically, but no one wants to be the asterisk Premiership winner when it all rolls around and it's just oh, that was the corona season so it's a it's a horrible place to be isn't it as a sports player and a fan but like I say it is um, there are, I suppose you just have to look at the bigger picture there are more important things that, but it's going to leave it in a mess isn't it like you say at the end of it when whatever they decide to do whatever gets decided for us there's going to be six or seven leagues to try and work out should anyone go up and down if they don't go up and down if then Saracen's got a case to be like well hang on if no one's going up and down can we hang on for one more year and it's just going to be it's going to be horrible but hopefully touch wood 4th of April or 6th of April rolls around and we can look at a way of trying to squeeze everything in and, and make it as business as normal yeah I mean it, that will that will be tough uh, and actually on that subject we'll get cr we'll get stuck into the the topics and questions actually from 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 the listeners so indeed looking at that size of that list is proof that a lot of people are self-isolating <laughs> <laughs> that's the most in-depth question list we've ever had well we'll get to the the, the proper in-depth one mm. pat curtis i mean hats off to you that's a that's a proper question uh, we've had loads in this is only a, a kind of a a small snapshot really of how many that have come in because we would have been talking for about five hours which actually is no bad thing sometimes, I suppose, well on do. the Stand Up podcast. Um, but uh, we do this every month and we kind of want topics to, to kind of keep us going and knowing that this might go on for a little bit longer. Next month's might be quite tough without any rugby <laughs> as well. So yeah. get them coming in. Stands.off at bbc.co.uk. It is indeed that. Us. Is that our official BBC email address? Please get them in. They are red, as you can see, and you remember to print them out this week. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I've actually managed to do something that I was supposed to. Uh, well, we'll start with the with the kind of topic of of the moment and coronavirus, COVID nineteen. Mark Hayden tweeted actually using the hashtag Stand Off Pod, saying, um, "For this season, what about running the whole campaign over the next two seasons, so we can kind of fit." everything in basically um, if you try and squeeze stuff in as we were talking about just a minute ago Carl might risk injuries for certain players if you're having to play maybe a game or two games a week which would be really quite difficult and then obviously you look at stuff like the Premiership Cup could that go by the wayside just so you can fit in the rest of this season over the next two years so that's from Mark uh, thoughts on that possibly as Jay, there's, there's a whole 
filing cabinet of brown envelopes with A to Z on and probably even got into the double A's as James has said about scenarios they're trying to work Possibly out. Possibly on because, laptops yeah, rather yeah. than as, well, no. than paper, paper I like to think they do it like evil villains all brown envelopes there's one in there with a question mark as well <laughs> just like well, that's the contingency but yeah like you just don't know I think the, the logical solution is if this pushes past a month and, and it does start to get to the territory the logical solution is unfortunately they will probably look at, at cancelling the league uh, and starting afresh because if you're talking about stretching it over two seasons there's just too many I think ramifications to that of people asking well I shouldn't be relegated I should have won the league I should get the money for that what, you know what do people what on earth happens with the salary cap if you're spreading it over two years it's just it's just it's a nightmare whereas if they just make a clean cut and, tr- and try and sort of work from next next September onwards possibly that could be the, and yeah without a doubt they'll have to look at dropping competitions my thoughts anyway and as well if you think that the, you know, there's a lot of games in the year already and if you try and cram in a load more the only people that are going to suffer are the players and you know player welfare obviously is a huge topic and has been now for a few years and you know if you ask, ask the players that are already playing a lot of games to then play a load more you know you, you are you're putting a lot of pressure on 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 the on the squads, and I think that would kind of it would be a, that would be a massive challenge, and and as you say, a potential risk for some of the players as well. Well, and also there are transfers. You know, people have signed contracts mm. for next season, haven't well, they? Well, this is the ironic. Thing. So I'm just going to jump in on this. Is the funny thing I thought about the other day is at the moment, Sale and Exeter are in the top two could well meet in the final if it gets to that point who's Sam Hill going to be playing for and that is actually something that popped into my head because I always think about Sam Hill but uh, yeah he's, he's, he's beautiful he, by the time that final rolls around if they were to push it he could be a contracted sale player and it's just like where on earth do you draw that line I don't know <laughs> well, that's a million dollar question for a player for whoever that putting that in um, listen uh, just go back on Jim's point I know you're talking about the player welfare and stuff and maybe playing games maybe two a week or whatever it is the only sort of same grace that is a lot of guys there's a lot of big squads mm-hmm. um, so unless there's rotation of squad it isn't ideal don't get me wrong but um, as a player I want to finish this season to be in the position we're in at the minute you know for all the hard work that's been put in to get to this point and for it just to be sort of it's been the most bizarre season anyway don't get me wrong with what's happening with Saracens and all those sorts of things it just seems to be one thing after the other but for us as players and being the position we're in you know it would be a real shame if we lost it now don't get me wrong there's bigger things in the world going on and if that's the way the best decision is for everyone's health to be that's what it has to be don't get me wrong but I'm just saying from a player's point of view it would be really quite devastating to be in this position to not be able to finish where we are at the other thing I suppose on the flip side you know I, I was talking about the negative points of it there but you know the positive sides you know, like with all things where where there is a, a something goes wrong there's always a, an opportunity that comes out of it and the opportunity might be that the squads have to be used a lot more you know you're going to get guys that are have been not getting as much game time as I like or not getting the opportunities to show what they can do at that level and those guys may potentially get those opportunities and you know and with that with opportunity you're always going to see someone come through that comes comes up steps up and then progresses really well you know and that's obviously you know a lot of big way that players get opportunities is through injury and whatever else normally but now this may provide a different way and you may see a, you know, another group of players come through that could potentially go on to be you know Top level players in internationals that that may have not had the opportunity due to the kind of the schedule or the way the squads work. Well, it will be a definitely watch this space sort of situation, that isn't it? I mean, we we just don't, we just That's don't what know. Everybody's doing looking at their phones and news all the time. Isn't it? That's all it is. Changes everywhere. Yeah, I know. Um, well, thank you very much for that question. That was from Mark. So we'll go into Pat's because we kind of touched on it a little bit there. What what kind of mindsets people will be in, players will be in, and. Um, Pat wanted us to have a bit of a, a light-hearted look at some quite serious issues. So the first of his two points were about mental toughness and resilience. And obviously at this moment in time, players, staff members, maybe at, at clubs thinking, you know, if this goes on much longer, I might not have a job because of finances around what have you, especially the lower down the, the pyramid of rugby you go. Um, but just in terms of all of you play the game at the highest level mental toughness situations has there ever been a moment possibly where you can think of bad injury bad defeat or something that didn't quite go well but you what did you do to remain positive and I know in the past you Steno have spoken about every kick that you take you uh, you think I could win the game with this kick which is that you know 
similar sort of mental toughness sort of situation. But when something's gone bad, what have you done to get out of it? And it might just be a really happy song. <laughs> Maybe it is. We're not singing. <laughs> um, well, a couple more of these than you maybe do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, that's, uh, right, so just in a, for me personally, like, I used to, when I was a lot younger, let's just take it into context, I used to base my entire rugby game on how I performed and how I kicked a goal. So if I missed two kicks at goal, I would have thought I had a shocking game. And I might have turned around and been one of the best players in the field, but I would have walked off that pitch quite distraught almost sometimes um, so but then whenever I got a bit older I kind of realised well actually all I was doing was putting myself in a position to win games whenever I'd be you know so I tried to flip it on its head a little bit and said that's my role in the team you know so if I had the opportunity to kick a goal that just gives us an opportunity to closer to winning a game maybe um, and, and the same like the lads will say here like Jim maybe turned the ball over in the ruck you know, it was an opportunity for him to win the game. So you kind of break it all down. That it's not all about one bloke, I suppose. Um, so in this kind of scenario, you know, we play in a team sport, but we do individual things within that team sport, which kind of adds up to the the result at the end of the day. So um, in a roundabout way, I suppose, if you're talking about mental resilience, it's more like you obviously everyone has their role to play in the game but once the moment's gone it's gone so there's no point in really worrying terribly about it worry about but, it after. but is that difficult to do because if of just course, say, course it is. just say if you do make quite a bad error on the pitch and it leads to a try or it's a last minute of the game and you miss a kick that you should normally get most of the time and you just think well yeah, but, but I would me. argue to me I, my argument to you is in that last minute to hit that kick all you've done is got an opportunity to win the game by you missing the kick well you've stepped up to do it me missing a kick well, people miss kicks all the time so if you put a positive spin on it and go this is a chance to win it this is not a chance to lose it this is a chance to win it that's probably another way of probably trying to flip it in his head yeah I think uh, like inevitably things aren't going to go right all the time and you know the, there are things the moments that go wrong and I think in the short term and the long term you, you more often than not a, a great way to cope and is the people around you and your support network so like you know on the pitch it's your mates and your people you're playing with and it's whether it's a, a tap on the ass to say come on let's come on let's get on together or whether it's you know when you get home your wife or your girlfriend you know saying you know sticking an arm around you or telling you to pull your head out your ass whichever one is appropriate then you know then that that is usually and the way i found the uh, coping with things that don't go perfect the, the people around you are the ones that really help the most and it kind of helps you like right okay come on let's go on with the next thing whether it's the next day whether it's the next moment immediately in the game and in the, but your people around you more often than not will help you through that do you have any examples as well Carl I mean I, both of you have spoken about the same thing that you kind of you just move on and try and get it get that situation out of your head and think about it in a different way but is there anything that's happened where you have actually thought for weeks about what's happened in a game possibly uh, well the, it depends on your selection <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you make a mistake uh, in a game and you get dropped because of it and you don't play for eight weeks you're going to think about it for eight weeks if you are lucky enough to play the next week sport is a lump, very lumpy carpet you just whoosh, swip it under there and it's all done as long as you do something right the next week um, so yeah it's, it's, it's really dependent on your circumstances but yeah like when, when back I was quite fortunate never had any major injuries that kept me out for long periods of time other than right at the start and then obviously the one that finished it all and so yeah if I've ever sort of got an injury it can in that bubble in that world it just feels like the world is over you know you've, you miss two games that's it the, you know back he's taking your name off the court board and that's you you don't you rip your contract up and it, it isn't the case but you feel that way so as James said you just sort of got to just, as you as I got older I was I wouldn't call myself mature but you got a little bit better at dealing with that each time and then yeah I saw a few people finish their careers in a, in sort of a bit of a cloud and I thought I don't want to try and be that so I'd sort of almost, almost try and over egg how happy I was. If I was in a bit of a mood or if I came in in the morning a bit, a bit annoyed about something like that, I would, I don't know, hide a Kai Horseman's pants in a ceiling tile. And then that, but that was a way of, you know, as a coping mechanism for me, I genuinely thought this is the way to do it, you know, just, 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 just make every day fun. And that, to be fair, turned out to be a great exercise for the entire year. So how many um, pairs of pants of Kai Horseman do you reckon are still up <laughs> in the so ceiling there, tile? It wasn't actually my idea, but I did draw, there was, a, there, was a, there was a strategy that we would hide his pants in the ceiling tiles every day until such time as he ran out of pants. And honestly, it went on for months. So how many pants that guy had, I have no idea. And it was, it was, it was, flag it was at least two months in before he finally turned around and went, uh, they were, they were taking my pants and we're just like I mean I, I would be 
I'd be raising eyebrows after day three, I reckon. I'd be like, where's my pants? I've, I'm running out. I have mothballs everywhere. But yeah, no, that was it. But yeah, that in answer to that, it, I wouldn't. I didn't have a coping mechanism, so to speak. But you just, yeah, I'd probably try and overdo certain things. Or like you say, I know a couple of injuries. I used to make a point of trying to get to the to be there first in the morning. I don't know why. It didn't make any difference. No one cared. But for me, if I got there in the morning at like seven o'clock. And did mine. I don't know. It just felt like I was doing something. So I've always been a fan of sort of like feeling like I've tangibly actually done something to try and get past my my woes, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, Pat's second point was was a bit around the kind of again t- this situation that we're in at the moment with with the coronavirus spread and people kind of feeling a little bit down. He he was saying it's important kind of not to take yourself too seriously and kind of think about doing things that make you laugh maybe putting pants up in a it does make you laugh up in a, a ceiling yeah. tile or singing Carl again I wanna, I, I, there's a, there's a <laughs> trend I, I want to get you, wanna get you yeah, going might need to get him a lot <laughs> but um, yeah, he wants to know whether there are any it could be on field off field moments that you just kind of still think of now that there's were one. kind of funny or embarrassing possibly for you as well but in a, but in a kind of quite nice there's way there's one funny moment that I can remember and you were definitely on the field that day I don't know if you were maybe here. It was at, at Harlequins with a certain Ben White. Um, mm. Indeed, I do. Uh, at the back of a mall, I believe it was, mm-hmm. was it? Yeah. Yeah, Sunday, yeah. Saturday afternoon, you know, about half three, primetime TV, um, BT Sport, and little Ben came out to play. Like, <laughs> a little, in the did, middle, yeah. of, a, in the middle yeah. of a mall. Uh, the shorts, really just there wasn't a close-up. Grabbed close up, the shorts yeah. and, yeah. Um, yeah. you know bit unfortunate for you know and social media being rife at the time by the time we all sort of got back on the bus it was literally like a ripple effect <laughs> sort of the first bloke sort of got his phone out and was just like what's this and then you just saw the whole bus just get excited from front to back and <laughs> <laughs> as everyone was just there like zooming in trying to work out what's going on here it was a great day yeah. in, a, in a really it's a great day weird. great year actually great year <laughs> cheers Ben just cheers cheers that, Ben if I'm honest with you that probably happened I reckon what three years before Ben left the Chiefs if two years three years it was a great three years yeah. never never a meeting went by without that being referenced without it being brought up mm. I'm actually I, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often you know, because you're tackling most, around that sort of area of short sort of area. Most people wear, wear a tight me. short. I mean, I know for a fact you used to like a like a, almost like a Vulcan grip sort of cycling short, didn't you? And uh, yeah, 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 and I, I always wore sort of a trunk. Because, and, because of that? Yeah. It doesn't I, slip away. I don't away. know. I, very rare. You go out, not often you go out there in a pair of apple catchers. You know, you're going to be... Yeah, I always like to get, keep things strapped up. <laughs> Prepared for the event, yeah, for that exact moment, yeah, no. But that is that's a horror one. But I, I am not. I think that's really strange. You can remember what pants he wore, like. <laughs> What can what, I say? What you, can I you're say? constantly you're taking Kai Horseman's pants. You're now remembering Jim's from years. There ago. are two or three people what else that are you doing in there? really felt comfortable with their clothes off, and James was one of them. <laughs> yes, that's very. True, and the other, actually. I seem to remember Hayden Thomas. Within, he walked into the changing room in full full tracksuit and bag, and by the time I'd looked down and up from my program, he'd Bruce Almighty'd everything off and was just stood in the. <laughs> and that's and that's how he spent the fair, remainder. That of, thing, <laughs> that's how he spent the remainder of the build up until he put his kit on. That's the thing. He would wear until the, yeah. the cameraman's usually the cameraman <laughs> will come in um, you know before a game and like literally take, try and take shots of lads coming in as soon as that cameraman would walk through the door he would mm. do the Bruce Almighty act mm. and literally follow the cameraman round mm. so any time like after clerk after the World Cup as well just, <laughs> but he'll, you know, he was, yeah. yeah but he, he was in budgies this man's walking around you right, know showing, showing the world like exactly you know how he came into the world so mm. you know, fair play. That was that was his go-to, wasn't it? And he literally <laughs> chased the cameraman until he left. Mm. Who would Good. be a cameraman? Eh? So there's one moment I can remember. <laughs> That's kind uh, of all, all around nudity and pants, though, really, isn't it? Most, yeah. to be honest with you, most of what we do will involve some kind of nudity. Yes, and no, nothing right, like. I enough. could remember. I mean, it still goes Maybe around. James, you'd like to discuss how you <laughs> prepare for a game before in prepare. hotels. Oh, well, uh, yeah. your your uh, little routine you would do before you leave a game. Yeah, well, I suppose it, it, it developed more as time went on, as my, the body started to give in on me. But I would have a, a nice soak, of which Brett Sturgis would usually run me a bath to make sure I stayed on his schedule. Because um, if he went off, then it was it was curtains for him for the day, and um, then just a, a nice twenty minutes of yoga. <laughs> Wearing anything? No, no, it would be free. free. (laughs) It would be free and uh, relaxed. So I remember sharing a room with James in uh, Claremont and not knowing any of these routines, right? So 
I don't know. Brett Sturridge obviously wasn't there. Yeah, I think he broke. I, I remember this being. You know, we go off and we get our our pre-match meal about half eleven, whatever. It's a three o'clock kickoff, and I come back to the hotel room, and uh, I, I'm getting looked at funny because I haven't run the bath. I was like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know what's going on." I've also left the toilet seat up. So oh, I'm, let, I'm letting all the luck out, apparently. I've never heard, have you ever heard that one? No, I've not heard that one. You have to explain one. that one yeah, yeah. to me. True story. <laughs> True story. Apparently, you leave the luck out whenever the toilet seat's up. And the next thing was, you know, we're getting ready. I'm getting changed. The man's lying on the floor, you know, no clothes on, pointing everything at me. And I'm like, right, hang on a second. I'm trying to prep here to go and play Clement. <laughs> Mentally visualising how you're going to play. This, blo- this bloke's lying on the floor, like, you know, so... Exactly. Thanks for that. Yeah. Prepare, preparing <laughs> mentally, really. I, I, don't, I mean, just on my, uh, I have two memories of playing Claremont away, and neither resulted well. So, but I don't think it's fair to blame James for those. To be I'm not blaming, but apparently <laughs> he's, he's, blaming, he's blaming me, me for leaving the toilet yeah, seat yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. To be fair, what, you, what happened the second time round? Would you leave that? To, how long do you leave that toilet seat open? Because well, the was not with the sixty points day. worth I've left it open for. That's what. Good lord, yeah, it's an absolute beating. So before work now, James, I I hate to kind of ask, but. Do you do the same routine? Well, then, no, because it <laughs> just seems seems superfluous <laughs> now. Before yeah. today, it's coming uh, here, it's irrelevant now. The way I hobble around, and also yeah. the fact that I'm not running around at all, I'm just standing still uh, for the majority of it. So, no, it's not necessary anymore. Sw- <laughs> moving on swiftly, uh, right, you. Dan? <laughs> Dan, where it's going well though. Dan Waring has tweeted with two questions um, for all of you. Then, has the ge- or how has the game changed? since you first started playing and he's put in brackets in the profile of the game laws of the game professionalism of the game etc 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 Carl Rimmer I mean none of us are that old that we no. predate professionalism yes. to be fair um, are we? No, no. I'm no, not, yeah. So we don't know why you're looking so, at me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I just thought I'd double check. Uh, so, but uh, I've been through, you know, the the wild west of the of the championship, as was Gareth and stuff like that, and it that's changed Thank a lot. You. If you catch my drift, it's um, <laughs> it's very, you know, we've gone through those days of you know losing two games on the bounce and then having the meeting with the chairman and suggesting that's the end of our jobs, and it's a bit like is that can they can they do that? I'm not sure, but yeah, well, well, then luckily they never did. But that that's definitely, I think. I don't know if that has changed, but once you get to the sort of the professional levels of, of the Premiership, that does become less of an issue. Tend to get shouted at a little bit less after consecutive losses. But no, I think profile would be the one I would touch on. Now, I, I don't think of myself in this bracket. I really don't. Uh, but you've got players now that are elevated above that status. Uh, and even going back two or three years, that a team social would have gone under the radar without any issues whatsoever. Um I'm not condoning ridiculous behaviour, but it goes on. But now that ridiculous behaviour must happen behind closed doors because if it does get brought into the public limelight, it's going to get found and magnified, and then it's just yeah. it's, that. That's where I would say it's changed a lot from day one to day now. Did yeah. you even see that literally overnight from when you won the Premiership to the next year that your profile nationally as a as a squad and even as all the players just grew again even more? Or not really? Mm, not really, I don't think. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know. Um, I know I took a ridiculous picture on the halfway line um, with no clothes on with a trophy. And, uh, it keeps on coming back to know, no clothes. About, no, about nudity. And, uh, and we were obviously all on, the, on, a, on a social that day. And by 7 o'clock that night, I had my brother ringing me to say that it was in the front page of the sun. Now, that obviously was a lie because it was trying to annoy my mother. Um, but um, you know it, it it wasn't true but uh, more to the point yes it probably not it, it's hard when you live in it a wee bit you kind of don't really yeah I, well, obviously, obviously I'd kind of I'd finished and I was off elsewhere whereas the lads kind of managed to win it and um, I'd, from the outside I it, it was kind of noticeable that the the interest levels in the club were had gone through the roof beyond that and you see it now it's kind of every year goes and the more success that the the club has and I think the, the sport in general is kind of um, seems to be more high profile in terms of media interest and everything um, so yeah I, I saw it from an outside point of view I did see that the profile of the players the club the sport in general did kind of did increase after the success <laughs> indeed, indeed as we see Steve-O yeah. crawl past us that, that would be where I'd say it's changed and if you want to go back to like, <laughs> like a madman you know there's the odd law change and stuff like that <laughs> and such forth but I don't 
I don't know if I noticed that over the time and certainly not on the outside looking in. Well, really the, 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 the yeah. kind of rule change that I'm looking at, especially in the last couple of years, is, and this might lead us into another question, is is around the scrums. They, they kind of changed the way that that was all set up with the engagement and everything. They've, they've changed that every year since I was 20 years old. There's always, there's always been something new, you know, from, I don't want to show my age, but I can't even remember what, 10 years ago, crouch, touch, pause, engage, to crouch, it, it, things like that have changed the way they look at it. But I, in 10 years of playing rugby, other than learning the fact that it was now three words instead of four, changed very little about what I did. You just sort of got on with it. And yet they're changing laws all the time for this, that, and the other. Some of them for safety things. So for instance, they tried to reduce the, the gap between the set. That, fair enough, completely agree with that. And everyone was in hoopla about it when it first came off. If we lose the set, we lose it. But you just get on with it. You just move with the punches and it, it is what it is now. Yeah. Has there been a rule yeah. change or a law change that you've really been against? At all. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking football now, obviously, and there's a whole thing around the handball law in yeah. football is different whether you're a defender or an attacker. There was a so rule, is there anything in rugby? There was rules that came out about when you kick the ball over the line and what was out and who took the ball out and all that sort of thing. And yeah. I'll be honest with you, I still don't know. <laughs> um, and we said, we said, <laughs> you just carry it out. Well, no, the, we, chief, we, the chiefs play to keep the ball in. I saw, so so that we, we, yeah. Well, yeah, but I think like we sit and we do halfback meetings on a Monday. You know, and we sit down and we'll watch the game from the weekend pr- previous. And we will generally sit there and we will discuss what has happened and why that has happened and go, is that the right decision? If this happened, what does that mean? You know, so even, don't worry, we're on the field and sometimes we don't really know what's going on, sometimes with questions and stuff. So it'd be good to get a, a referee's perspective. Well, I'll say this, yeah, to be honest, I'll say this, Lee, J, Lee James into it as well, because he's a coach now, right? So my, here's my thoughts on it and, and why I, I said this about football. So rule changes happen. So for instance, I can think of one where it was the whole uh, contesting the ball in the air thing. And if you aren't contesting, you obviously get a yellow card or, or whatever you, if it's red, if he lands on his head. Now, whether you argue that rule is right or wrong, when that first happened I think we had two yellows in two games for things like one was it and I remember Ian Witten getting one and it was pretty harsh but the way Rob explained it was just this is now a penalty you will cost the team if you do this stop doing this and I always look at that and I'm like I see people complaining about why football is screaming the ref's face and swear at him the amount of money that rides on football games why are they not just being told if you do that red card them just red card them on the spot do it done Two games from then, all the clubs will go, we probably better stop doing that. <laughs> we can't keep playing games without our strikers. You know, that's my thoughts on it anyway. But, um, yeah, there you are. But as a coach, like you say, when the rule changes come in, I suppose you may have to look at it in slightly more detail than players who just go, OK, yeah, give that well, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think when they do, you know, yeah. we're fortunate enough to be involved in some of the Junior World Cups and they, they often use those for experimental rules, which they did in the last one, which, which I was at. Um, and when the rule changes come in, I think the big thing is just being as clear as possible with the players, you know, uh, so that they completely understand the new rule, regardless of, like you say, whether you agree with it or don't, you know, the, you have to kind of adjust to it, otherwise it will cost you, like you say. And then as well, you know, making sure that the players understand the consequence of, of what their sanctions are for whatever rule is and, you know, and, and you know, rugby players generally are, are pretty good and they understand consequence. I think like you said, Rims, you know, and they're, um, and then that will then change obviously behaviour and that's, you know, the point of the rules more often than not to try and change some behaviours to try and, whether it's to make it safer or, or for whatever reason and usually the safety aspect. Um, but being clear as possible at, from the get-go is the thing that helps it the most from, you know, from the other side of the coin. Right, we're, we're running out of time a little bit, so let's let's do some quick fires. Okay, so um, this is Dan's second question from his dad. Uh, so very quickly, if you can, with the amount of tackles and hits you make in a game, how does your body recover from the impact, Jim? Still hasn't <laughs> never, uh, well, no, I never recovered. I, I, I never, I never really recover. I limp around her and <laughs> yeah. you don't. No, that's it. Yeah, literally. That, you see Hannibal Lecter when he gets wheeled into prison. That's how Jim used to get delivered to training. <laughs> just delivered to the sideline and just unclipped, and then you just it's come over. Back out oh, horrible here. reference. <laughs> Carl. But that is essentially it. They would, a pump truck would bring him to training and then return him back to, to where your warm up was terrific. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think it's kind of uh, so. The older you get, the older you get, the, the obviously the longer it takes to recover. And you know, some some weeks by the time you're at the end, it takes till Friday. You know, and then you're back. You're back to back to normal as best you can be and then you'd go again but you know the younger you are you kind of roll through the hits a bit more don't you but you know essentially you kind of you don't you don't really recover that much but what does happen is your body does get a bit more hard and you do get used to kind of like taking the impacts and stuff and um 
and you know that that, that does happen to a, to a point but some of those collisions i mean i i will bring myself back to my playing days obviously, <laughs> of, obviously. you love school. to do that don't you <laughs> When I play with Dave Ewers and even tackle practice with Dave <laughs> at 14. He loves that club. He loves yeah, to come out it's, with it's that my one. only claim to fame, I'll pick fellas. It up. Come on. I'll pick it up. Dave Ewers, yeah. What Charlie means, he wore a backpack. <laughs> Dave put his arm through it and picked it up like a tackle pad. <laughs> That's what no, he means. I, 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 it, 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 was, it was terrifying. It was literally terrifying. So thank you for that. That's great. Um, we'll go for the cliche. This is from Ben. Who is the best player you've played with or against and why? So mine's Dave Ewers. <laughs> So, and this is generally not a joke, I've been asked that question a few times, yes. and I have given it some serious thought, and it is actually Dave Ewers. <laughs> I think he's, uh, when that bloke's on form, I genuinely think he, I don't think he carries a team, but he, like when he's running around with the size he is and the, and the things he can do, and I, what, like, I, you know, it makes me be like, oh, I wouldn't mind doing that. You know, and it makes me want to play harder. So it's not just about what he can physically do. I actually think he drags it out of other people as well without even trying because he's not a very vocal person. But he just, yeah, and anyway. So it is actually Dave Ewers. <laughs> so you know. I've said it before, Sorelli Nakalavuki, when that guy decided to play rugby, he made it look so easy. He did it with a smile on his face and he generally, he took the two Irish centres who were, you know, uh, Grand Slam winners at the time, British and Irish lands, and he made them look silly. And that guy was just a different level whenever he wanted to be. Yeah, I was with, uh, with would, would, yeah, you'd, I would say Sorelli as well. You know, he was just the man was phenomenal. He could he could do a bit of everything, playing the forwards as he decided to do every now and again with a number eight tape, number eight tape to the back of his uh, <laughs> shirt in training to show Rob that he could play in a number eight as well. Yeah, he was phenomenal. But uh, I would say that the other person that for me the best player I played against would be Olivier Magna, the French flanker that I remember that is showing your ears yeah, right? know, yeah. <laughs> wow it is I was I was, I was, I was um, you might have to explain who that is uh, uh, yeah. like, well, he was a, a French French flanker was, you know was was a super talented at all parts of the game you know he could run kick pass tackle he was he was sensational I remember playing against him as a 21 year old and coming off the pinch thinking what the hell just happened you know I've just been absolutely uh, pulled inside out and um and shown how to play the game and I, I, I never forget that day and it was um, certainly something that stuck in my mind and a player that I always admired as well so it was a, it was a long old afternoon uh, again at Claremont um, but uh, but you know a the there's nothing but long afternoons him. there the hours seem to really drag in the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> the, evening, the evenings have a <laughs> flyby yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah evening's a great night yeah, yeah. Uh, on Sorelli do you ever were you at Exeter when they did give him a bash in the forwards because his versatility dropped at training basically yeah, when it I came did, to yeah. games you could probably have slotted him anywhere and he would have done a job when it came to a January afternoon's line out sessions yeah. and his knees were shot to pieces and they just thought they'd give him a crack at a flanker that was a hilarious thought yeah, <laughs> he didn't jump did he uh, no, no he wasn't he, allowed he, to he, jump he wasn't allowed <laughs> to because of yeah. the state of himself at the mm -hmm. end but he, he could still do it though like, yeah, like he could, no, he on a Saturday a do it, like. he could have done it but yeah when you sort of talking him through line out moves and he's just there in as many clothes as he could possibly wear just like hunkered <laughs> down with a scrum hat on in a non-contact session he, 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 did, uh, he did not fan, he did not enjoy his move to the back row and that's when he was ripping the number 8 off the back of his shirt in training and thinking he had a flasker in his back but yeah he's, he's actually lost a lot of weight now I, wanna, I can believe that and he's um he's he's moving around a bit better when I saw him a while ago and he was uh, he was moving around all right love good I'm glad to hear it <laughs> he could come back he could welcome he could appear <laughs> under, an, <laughs> under a pseudonym at age 23 <laughs> with a new set of knees ready to go uh, right a couple more um, one for you Stino uh, what was going through your head when you kicked that penalty back in 2017 in the final against Wasps that one eh uh, that no, one, yes, that one. Um, what was going through my head? It was just literally a boring one. Uh, literally stick to the process, what I'm trying to do here. I did say a little prayer to me, old boy, up, up, up top. I have said that, you know, it was more like, you know, if you could, the actual words I used was, if you could help me with this one, I'd be very grateful. And, uh, yeah, very thankful that uh, it went in the right direction. But, like I said, it, I, I actually thought that it was going to be, it, it was a chance to win the game. I've sort of said that already. But, um I did think that I'd get another go if it didn't go over at the very least. So I didn't put everything on that. And I think if I had to put everything on it, it might, it might have been maybe might have been a different outcome. But I've been kicking well that day, so I was quite confident taking it. So um, that was pretty much what was going through my head. A prayer to me, old boy upstairs, like. And it was. What was going through your head, Carl? Tired. <laughs> for me, for me, that was it. Please. He may he may not have been putting the pressure on himself, but I was. I was just watching him. Either. If that don't go over, I don't think we can get back up here again, mate. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> so, you had yeah. Two minutes to go. Then. Yeah, no, I know we did, Gareth. But I was. You know, I you, was, did, you put in a big shift. I was already in my overdraft of energy, so. There was 
was no <laughs> there was no getting any further so when I saw it sail over I was happy I was a happy man uh, yeah. we'll, f- we'll end with this one um, and it's for you James ask Jimmy about his time at the University of Bath what a side he played in so what was it like that's from Stuart Lowe um, I believe you know yeah thank you Louis um, it was a, an education on and off the field um, uh, it has nothing to do with my studying um, which just to be honest was minimal um, uh, and there were, there were great, a great set of guys that, we've, that we had in the team actually that, um, that kind of went on to play real well and, uh, and are still, still in the game now and um, made some lifelong friends as you do when you're playing kind of that, that part of rugby and it was um, yeah I'll say an education on and off the field there was another question for Jim from, uh, oh yes, there was. There was another question that came in on our Twitter, on our Twitter account. Um, uh, uh, it was basically, are you looking for a, a prop slash ball playing twelve and a scrum leveler to hold the butt by any chance? And that was from uh, a Tuani Hui. Tuani Hui. Uh, uh, well, I suppose whoever this character is, Tuani Hui, <laughs> send in send in some kind of CV or some kind of highlights package, and we'll, we'll have a look at him. Have you got and an a birth certificate. Can send, it <laughs> <laughs> can send it, I think, to the standoff. The standoff. Stand dot off at BBC. Yeah, yeah and you can send that in, and we'll have a look at this Tuani Hui character. Indeed, we will. Be interesting. Seems Good. Like uh, I also think um, that we, Steno, should adopt the the standoff y- uniform <laughs> for the for the next time we do it. Possibly. I mean, Carl. I do like you know. You know my life ones is you, can say, you haven't got your days. tie on. I took the I tie took, off because I thought I thought for a Friday afternoon beer podcast. Friday it wasn't, morning. It wasn't morning. Friday morning. <laughs> it wasn't a tie sort what of thing. It's, yeah. it's kind of like a. It's a lovely. Yeah. Jacket. Well I have dressed. a very an interesting life these days, and I have to wear a suit to work. So. <laughs> well, you look good I'm doing here. it, Carl. Thank you. Do guys. look good doing it. it. I really do yeah. appreciate it. It's all so good. It's You're not good. wearing your jacket for me to mock um, because it had duct tape on when I got here. So. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm at a loss. You did. <laughs> on, look, there's no yeah, yeah. duct tape anywhere on me. So. Indeed. Yeah, you look sharp. You look. You've actually reversed it, haven't you? You normally burgundy trousers. No, no. Normally green, moss, green trousers, yeah. yeah, fair dues, fair dues. This is all we've never signed off on video before. No, I know. Normally do, we do just we, sort of say do it? thanks and put the mics down, and then you edit it all. What are we going to do now? Well, I think we should end with a with a, a um, <laughs> oh yeah, handshake. and uh, mm. you know we all need really? social isolation. I think definitely we need yeah, to definitely yeah, well wash our hands. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers to everyone well. and keep stay going. healthy. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay yeah. safe. Wash no your hands. About it. Wash your hands and uh, yeah. See you all soon. Look out for the next podcast, then, isn't it? Indeed.